Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to, to Canberra Museum and Gallery. I'm Shane Brainard, and for those of you I haven't met, I'm blessed to be the director of this place. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional uh, indigenous occupants of this land on which we stand or sit today, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I'd like to extend uh, this acknowledgement to uh, elders past, present, and indeed First Peoples who may be with us today. Um, I've been looking forward all week to this moment, not just because it's a nice summer Friday afternoon, <laughs> they're always <laughs> sweet, uh, but this is particularly sweet because um, like a migratory bird herself, we have the wonderful Jeannie Baker back with us here at Canberra Museum and Gallery. Um, we were talking earlier, and I think this is probably the fourth exhibition of hers that this place has hosted. Um, they are always popular with our staff and with our audiences, uh, big and small. Uh, indeed, one, um, one of Jeannie's books, Window, um, we use at another site that this organisation runs, Mugga Mugga, a historic home near Narrabunda. If you haven't been there, um, it's open most weekends and really worth dropping into. We use that book in our children's education programs and have done for about the past 10 years. Um, and we have college activities connected with that book as well. So it's a real uh, perennial favourite of ours. So Jeannie um, is, of course, I'm sure known to all of you here as a renowned collage artist and author. Um, Thank you for joining us for this artist talk ahead of the exhibition launch where we will see some sketches and the collages that sit uh, behind the pages or on the pages, in the pages of her um, new 2016 book, Circle. For those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to read this book, it takes us on a journey following the flight of bar-tailed godwits an endangered migratory shorebird that follows an ancient migratory pathway from Australia and New Zealand to the Yellow Sea of China and Korea, and then to Alaska and back south over a year period. Indeed, the bar-tailed godwit is a regular visitor to our very own Canberra, to Jerobomba wetlands, um, where it is seen most years around late October. I'm not sure if they're there right now, um, but maybe worth a visit, it's not far away. Circle tells a tale of ecological decline but insists on a message of hope and the importance of conservation. It's directed at a, a younger audience, the custodians of our shared environmental future. And it's an enduring pleasure to me, um, as I'm sure for everyone it is here, that um, even though such books may be designed for younger audiences, we gain just as much pleasure from them. Um, many of you here tonight are teachers or librarians, um, and you're very instrumental in our community in working with younger people to inspire thoughts of conservation and our shared global future. Uh, you've probably been reading or poring over Jeannie's books for many years and are very familiar with her work, but I'd like to share just a little of Jeannie's background um, before I hand to her. Jeannie was born in the UK and finished art college there before settling in Australia. Um, while at art college, Jeannie began making her artwork as dimensional scenes, exploring the magic of texture using real materials. Uh, Jeannie's work has evolved since moving to Australia. Um, her concerns have become more global. The detail of her works are finer, but still with a delight in texture and the use of natural materials and illusion, at the, I think, at the same time. Um, her, the work that um, illustrates her picture books stands individually uh, as a work of art in itself. Her works, her, her books are part of many, um, sorry, her artworks are part of many public collections and have been exhibited in galleries in London, New York and throughout Australia. Circle travels to CMAG from the Newcastle Museum and we're very grateful for the opportunity to show it here. Um, it, the, this talk has been very well received. Indeed, we, we have been booked out for this talk and we do have some overflow space. Um, luckily, a few people have been running late enough for us to um, allow some of you to migrate in here for the talk and they, they get the other room where we have a screen uh, broadcasting the talk today. Hello if anyone's there already. <laughs> um, 
it's a very promising sign, I think, for the popularity of the exhibition. Before I welcome Jeannie to the lectern, just a few housekeeping matters. At the conclusion of the presentation um, today, we hope there'll be a chance to ask a few questions um, from those of us in the main theatre here. But don't worry if time's running short um, or indeed you're joining us from next door, you'll get a chance, I'm sure, to catch Jeannie later tonight. Immediately after this session, there'll be an opportunity to purchase Jeannie's books at the Dimex pop-up store in our foyer. And Jeannie has kindly agreed to sign copies this evening. Um, you've all, of course, been invited to join us um, for the exhibition opening, which will follow the um, hot on the heels of the book signing. Um, and then don't miss the chance following that to have your first peek inside the exhibition, which is upstairs in Gallery 5. We've also dropped copies of our CMAG Family Events Flyer on your seats. Um, this exhibition is on, I think, well into February, so feel free to drop back over the summer period and enjoy some of those programs with younger members of your family or, indeed, friends' families. Um, there's a lovely activity table that's set up and there's a family trail through the exhibition. There are also some CMAG on Sunday events. Um, and finally, a gentle reminder for everyone, please set your phones to silent and um, please don't uh, record the presentation today, um, but you can feel free to uh, make the odd tweet if you like. I think it's only in keeping with the spirit of the day. Um, so now, please join me in welcoming our special guest this afternoon, author and artist Ginny Baker. Thank you, Shane. Um, I'm going to talk a little about how my work has evolved and talk about some of my books, and in particular, I'll talk about Circle. And then, as Shane said, there'll be a little bit of time where I can answer any questions. From my very first books, I've worked in collage. And for me, this medium evolved from a love of texture, a love of the tactile qualities of things. I found I could build up my pictures with the materials that otherwise would have to be painted. And gradually, a whole world of textures and possibilities opened up for me, which I'm still exploring today. <coughs> Whenever I can, I'll use the actual texture of whatever I'm trying to depict in my collage. I've explored building up my collages in layers to achieve a sense of space and depth within the work. Some of this texture and spatial quality seems to come across in the printed reproduction. I'm often told that children will try to pick bits off the pages in my books or stroke the textures. <coughs> my project, Where the Forest Meets the Sea, was an important turning point for me. The experience of being alone, camping out, and exploring the strange, rich environment of North Queensland's Daintree Rainforest had a huge impact on me. It opened up something in me. Before venturing into the rainforest, I'd spoken to various people living close by who'd warned me of various dangers. I was told I should go with company, but if I really wanted to go alone, I should take a gun. So as you can imagine, I set off into the danger very cautiously, but found these warnings to be based on myth rather than reality. It was my first experience of realizing how out of touch most of us are with the natural world. So I wanted to share how special the forest is and that it is not a frightening, threatening place. I tried to show the boy at one with the forest. He explores it barefoot, dressed only in a pair of shorts. Everywhere I explored, I saw something new. In my work, I go to great pains to be botanically accurate and to communicate some of the rich diversity of this environment. Even in 1985, it wasn't possible to be in the Daintree and not be aware of large bulldozers preparing lots for subdivisions and totally clearing sites of trees. This struck me as a great absurdity when the one thing that makes this area so special is the forest itself. We go to remote, unique, and wonderful environments to explore and enjoy their unique qualities, and yet we have to make our mark, build our building, and ultimately make this faraway place the same as the place we were getting away from. So in this work, I play with time. 
I try to give a child a sense of the great age of this forest, which would have been standing when dinosaurs were roaming Australia. I use images from the past and melt them into the present so the reader has a sense of timeless continuity in the forest. I pose the end of the work as a question, hoping to promote classroom discussion, hoping to provoke the child to ponder and decide for themselves the future they would prefer for such special places. My picture book, The Story of Rosie Dock, is set in the Central Australian desert. I was surprised to find how wonderfully rich in indigenous plant life our Australian deserts can be. It was my intention that the reader of this book initially think the story is about Rosie Dock, an unnamed woman I feature in the visuals, who plants in her garden a plant with beautiful red seed pods from the other side of the world. We see the seed pods carried by wind and flood to various other parts of the desert. Following the flood, and now I'm reading from the book, the air came alive with insects and perfume flowers grew everywhere. The harsh searing sun soon evaporated the water. Wind sucked away the last traces of moisture, leaving only mirage and a sea of rolling sand. The pattern continues with many more cycles of rain and drought. Dust storms scatter seeds and bury them in the desert sand. And now, when the rains have watered the desert, rosy dock, the plant with beautiful red seed pods, is spreading like a great red blanket further than the eye can see. And it's only at this point, the final page of the book, that many realise Many readers realise that Rosie Dock is the introduced plant, and then I leave it for the reader to ponder on the impact some introduced plants can have. It's only in the visuals we see the introduced plant as a monoculture. The only other thing that's shown to survive amongst it are rabbits, another introduced species. I hope readers will compare the rich diversity of healthy native de desert landscapes following a flood and question what happens to our wealth of native plants and animals in vast landscapes that have become monocultures. The story of Rosie Dock celebrates the richness of the Central Australian desert, but depicts how such a simple thing as an introduced plant can spread from a garden to a point where it's transforming great landscapes into monocultures. I vividly recall my wonder and delight in seeing giant kelp forests for the first time. I found these giant swaying underwater forests to be as enchanting, complex, and full of variety as rainforests on land. Kelp has long suffered from the bad attitude of people. It tangles people's boats when they anchor and gets wrapped around the propeller. It might get slimy and smelly when it's piled up on a beach. The negative attitudes, even there in, in the name, with it being referred to as a weed. Seaweeds are diverse and wondrous plants, beautiful and extraordinary to see and explore. And in the hidden forest, I'm trying to give a sense of this. The particular kind of kelp I base my book around is known as giant kelp. Giant kelp forests grow in temperate waters in various parts of the world. In Australia, some can still be found growing in the southern waters of Tasmania, though sadly these are currently in rapid decline. The kelp can grow in fairly sheltered shallow water that a child could easily explore, but also grows up to 30 metres from the sea floor to the water surface, where it continues to grow and hang in sometimes dense canopies along the water surface. When you get large quantities of it, it looks like a rainforest, and it's as complex, multi-layered, and magical as rainforest on land, and nurtures a great variety of other plants and animals. Because life beneath the sea is hidden, it's easier for us to remain ignorant of its richness, and the mere strangeness of the world beneath the sea encourages the imagination to develop ideas of scary, or undesirable elements to feed our paranoia and ultimately help justify 
our mistreatment of this environment. We often abuse and treat with disdain and imagine the worst of those things we don't know and those things that are foreign and strange to us. Here I've tried to depict Ben's paranoia. Ben is imagining every tendril of the cult as a monster grabbing at him, though it's just out of his eyesight. The blades of the kelp of his fear are simultaneously the tentacles of an octopus. But with the one simple step of breaking through the surface of the sea, with a mask to see by and a snorkel to breathe by, everything suddenly changes. Ben finds himself in a whole new world which is totally unlike what he expected. Suddenly he can see, and the more he sees, the more caught up he becomes in the wonder of what's around him. And in seeing the wonder of what's in this environment, Ben begins to value it. A picture book has the potential to powerfully tell a story without words. Telling a story purely with pictures permits a much more free-form story with the potential to be full of clear and obscure clues, allowing the reader to play a bigger part in the interpretation of the book. In this work, I show a window every two years, the passage of time being marked by the birthday cards of Sam, the boy whose bedroom window we're looking from. And we also see him grow from a baby to a man, finally with his own baby, in my imagination, the story is set in the suburbs of Sydney. So all the plants, insects and animals in the book can be found in the suburbs of Sydney. The work's intended to convey to a child the nature of change and how small changes added to small changes can eventually result in major change. I try to explore the concept of exponential change. The window's view incorporates the backyard of the house of the window, where you can see Sam as he grows up, making changes for himself, as a way of trying to show how we each play a part in making small changes which contribute to the larger change. There are lots of patterns in the work. For example, as bush is depleted, native birds, animals and insects disappear, and the few birds and animals that survive are increasingly introduced species. In the last scene from this particular window, um, there are no more native birds to be seen. And in my mind, um, or no more birds to be seen, in my mind, Sam misses them. So he hangs a knitted stuffed one from his window. And the next door neighbor, um, cats keep having kittens. So he ends up with something like 28 cats. And, um, as the landscape is cleared and more houses and, and then start, skyscrapers start appearing, in my mind the community misses the, misses the bush, so they paint it back on a wall. In the final scene, Sam has moved to the bush to live with Tracy, his girlfriend, who um, you meet if you know the book Belonging. Um, the view from their new window is similar to the first image in the book, except details show changes already happening, the implication being the changes will continue to accelerate unless something happens to stop this cyclic pattern. Picture books are often used as metaphors. I see window as a metaphor for our changing world. The idea for mirror came from doing a lot of travelling, in countries very different to Australia, from traveling to places like India, China, and Africa, where I met people very different to me, different in the way they dress and how they live, the color of their skin, their language. They were sometimes very poor. As a traveler, I was a stranger. I was the one who looked different. But what I found everywhere I traveled was people were usually fantastically friendly and generous, even if they had nothing. It made me think about the ways we are different, but I also thought about the ways we are the same, and that's where I got the idea for this work. Mirror parallels the day in the life of two families living in opposite sides of the world. One family lives in the hurly-burly of inner-city Sydney, 
and the other in a tiny remote village in southern Morocco. The book has two parts and was designed so that when it's open, both can be looked at simultaneously. Arabic, the written language of Morocco, reads from right to left, from top to bottom, whereas English reads the other way round, from left to right. So by designing the two parts of the, of the story to face each other, it's possible to open out the pages and turn them to read the two, sides side by, two parts side by side, each part of the story finishing at the centerfold of the book, where the two parts interlink. I hope this work encourages people to be enriched and curious rather than fearful of cultural difference, and to see the stranger as most probably in the ways that really matter, not a stranger at all. The two worlds I show, the worlds of central Sydney and a remote Moroccan village in the Valley of the Roses, couldn't be further apart. Yet in showing the parallel lives of the two families in my story, we see a simple truth, that despite strikingly different lifestyles, remotely different countries, differences of clothing and all, The two families are essentially the same. They care for each other, they need to belong, to be loved by their loved ones and be a part of their community. Even with all these differences, we are the same. We are the mirror of each other. Circle features a Bartel Godwit that migrates from its breeding grounds in the Alaskan tundra to its southern home in Australia, a distance of 11,000 kilometers without even stopping to rest. This is the longest unbroken distance traveled by any animal in the world. The bar-tailed godwit is a shorebird. It feeds in shallow water or on wet, sandy or muddy flats on coastal and inland wetlands by rapidly probing its long bill deep into mud to detect and catch its prey. Just before migration, godwits double their body weight and shrink non-essential body organs. This extra fat acts as the fuel for its long journey. The godwit survives around the availability of plentiful food at all times. In the Arctic winter, their food disappears completely, which forces the godwits to make their extraordinarily long journey in return for food on a southern coastal mudflat in Australia or New Zealand. As the idea for this work evolved, I made my own journeys across the globe to observe the birds and the landscapes they inhabit. This is the way my work develops from my personal experience of the landscapes and details I'm working with. I travelled to Alaska longing to see the wild remote landscapes where Godwits start their life. The 80,000 square kilometre Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge in southwest Alaska is in both density and species diversity the most bird-rich tundra in the Arctic world. It's an enormous food bowl for birds in the Arctic summer. Within the delta, 205 kilometres northwest of the north town of Bethel is a place known as Old Shivak, it used to be a Yupik Eskimo village, but in 1950, to avoid flooding, the village of Shabbat was moved to its new location. The village church remained behind and has since served as a field camp for biologists. I've been granted permission to join a field camp there. From the air, I see the delta is a vast, seemingly endless mass of complicated snaking rivers that meander among a great permafrost maze of grassy marshes, bogs, potholes, ponds, and lakes. I arrived on an Alaskan summer's day when the rivers were free enough of ice for a float plane to land safely at the river's edge close to the camp. I walk across deep mud at the river's edge where we land. My book boots sink right into the mud and stick there. It's almost impossible to lift them without lifting my feet right out of the boots and leaving them behind. In the camp cabin, I'm introduced to the only other woman, a bird scientist, five male bird scientists, and a vet who's there to operate on captured godwits 
and insert a satellite transmitter into their bodies in order to determine exactly where the Godwits lie. When I set up my tent alongside the other tents close to the church, it must have been after midnight, though still light. The following day, wearing thigh-high rubber wading boots, I take off on my own to explore the boggy country in the vicinity of the camp. The rivers, lakes and swamps are interspersed with areas of grass and higher mounds, which were like gardens, growing a richly dense variety of mosses, lichens and arctic plants with tiny leaves and flowers. The more I look, the more variety of plants I find. Godwits had already arrived and were hiding their nests. I see sandhill cranes in the distance. Their long necks and long legs make them appear huge. Of the birds I can identify, there are arctic terns, western sandpipers, cackling brent geese, black turnstones, tundra swans and peregrine falcons. Birds have migrated here from many parts of the world. Being here, I start to understand why the Guchin Eskimos call Alaska the land where time began, as each year, countless mammals, birds and fish from around the world migrate to and from the Arctic. It's a convergence point for millions of birds and animals journeying by air, land and sea, some making the longest migrations of their kinds on the planet. A few days later, many creatures start emerging from the wetlands. Midges, crane flies, hordes of tiny, swarming insects. The mosquitoes stop me from enjoying my walks now. They even bite me through two pairs of gloves and manage to get under my mosquito hat, ne hat net, though I'm better off with than without it. The godwit chicks feed on the mosquitoes. The air becomes so thick with mosquitoes they merely have to open their beaks and mosquitoes fly inside. Godwits can be difficult to see on their breeding grounds as their colours blend perfectly into the same colours in the landscape and provide them a perfect camouflage until they take to the air. The tundra is alive with potential godwit predators, foxes, weasels, minks, hawks, falcons, cranes, jaegers, gulls and owls. Some years, very few young survive. One of the most special experiences I had while in Alaska was kayaking on a glacial lake. I, lead, I read from my diary. The scenery was breathtakingly beautiful. Clouds of mist gave the landscape a mysterious, dreamlike quality. At times, it seemed almost as if I was floating through a sky of clouds. The forms of the icebergs were ever-changing. Some were like caves, some like mushrooms. And in the background was always the sound of the icebergs creaking. At one point, our guide stopped in his tracks, obviously listening to a different kind of rumbling noise, which continued for a while before it changed to a deafening rush. This noise continuing a while. It was the sound, he told us, of an iceberg turning over. I also travelled to the Alaskan Peninsula where godwits gather to fatten up ready for their long journey south. It was too early in the summer for godwits to be there, but I wanted to get a feeling for the landscape they inhabit. I was given permission to stay in Isenberg National Wildlife Refuge, a 2,020 kilometre refuge within the Alaskan Peninsula at a place called Cold Bay, which is far down on the peninsula. Despite it being summer, Cold Bay was windy, misty and cold. I wonder if this is what gives this place its name. Despite being told it was currently warm, Cold Bay, and the wind slight compared to normal, I find it bitterly cold and windy. I have to make myself get out to explore this place. Every day I'm conscious this could be the best weather I experience there. And to make the most of it, Everywhere I go, there's a backdrop of moody, snow-capped mountains. The region is home to large herds of caribou, wolf packs, and brown bears. I'm advised to watch for bears when I'm out walking, though I'm told they're probably more afraid of me than I of them. I found it easy 
country to get lost in an experience I almost had, as in places everywhere looked very similar. I found it scary country as it was so unfamiliar to me, and I always felt uneasy knowing bears were around. The russet, brown and black markings, which make shorebirds so difficult to see on the nests in the tundra, stand out on an open tidal flat. As soon as they arrive on their Alaska non-breeding grounds, the birds begin to replace their breeding plumage with colours that will disappear into the colours of the mudflats. Male and female godwits will now look more alike as they grow similarly coloured feathers. The godwits return to Alaska along the East Asian Australasian flyway, which extends from Australia and New Zealand to within the Arctic Circle. Flyways are the routes travelled by migrating birds. They contain a chain of important wetlands where the birds can rest and feed to gain the fat they need to fuel their flight. The East Asian Australasian flyway is particularly important as it is the most species diverse flyway in the world, but it's also the most threatened because its wetlands are rapidly disappearing. It is becoming harder and harder for godwits and other migrating birds to find places where they can stop and feed on their long journey. I also travelled to the Yellow Sea, an important area for many species of migrating shorebirds. I had been granted permission to stay in Yellow Yang Wetland National Nature Reserve. The reserves in China are very different from wildlife reserves here. In China, a reserve sits side by side with economic interest and farming, fishing, towns, villages, small factories and power stations lie within the reserve boundaries and there are 30,000 people living in this one. Immediately adjacent to this reserve is the rapidly growing city of Dongang, and so it follows that another problem for the birds is excessive disturbance from human activity. The rich mudflats of this part of the Yellow Sea, around the Yellow River mouth and close to the North Korean border, are recognised as the most important Godwit site. 70 to 80 percent of the Godwit population gather here in vast flocks for about a month while they rest and feed to gain the fat they need to fuel the last leg of their flight to their breeding ground. They need enough fat not just to get them there but to keep them alive for the first weeks after their arrival in the Arctic if there are snowstorms. Yet even here, the place understood to be the most the single most important site for Godwits in the entire Yellow Sea region, despite it being a nature reserve and despite its role within an international network of shorebird sites, development continued. I was interested to see for myself the changes that are happening here. A lot of the, the images I observed have become detailed in my work. At the reserve headquarters, I'm introduced to the manager and five New Zealanders who are helping the reserve centre staff do bird counts. I read from my diary. Today I catch a bus to Dongang, the town close to the part of the reserve frequented by most birds, particularly godwits, as I want to explore the recent developments that have encroached on the reserve. Estella, a Chinese New Zealander, has written lots of instructions in Chinese for me to show to the various people who can help me, the first being to purchase a bus ticket to Donggang. At Donggang, I find a taxi outside the bus station and giving the driver the question in written Chinese, ask how much he would charge for driving me for three hours in the vicinity of Donggang. I hold up 150 UN. He signs no. So I walk away towards the next closest taxi. He runs after me quick as a flash, accepting my offer of 150 UN. We head off for the power station, and I let my driver know when I want to stop and take photographs. I'm sure it looks quite odd that I want to photograph building sites, piles of concrete, mud and stone. I then hand my driver the note in Chinese, explaining that I'm an artist and want to survey the area from above for some artwork I'm making. I point to the tallest building in the area. My driver laughs and we drive towards what I eventually see is a building still in the process of construction. From a distance, it looked finished. 
My driver talks to a couple of workmen on the site. They point to their hard hats, communicating I will need to wear one. I smile and nod, this is no problem. The young man then escorts me into the building. We climb a few flights of stairs in near darkness. I switch on my torch until the staircases are lit by daylight. We reach a point where I'm gestured over to look from a window and I take a photograph from windows each side of the building. The young man just gesticulates upwards and I nod. We climb a few more staircases. At this point, an older man appears and demands to know who I am. A heated conversation takes place. The older man, obviously furious I've been allowed up. He insists I go no further and escorts us both down to the ground level where he points me to a seat. And he and a group of men continue a heated discussion. I feel sorry for the young man. It seems I've got him in a lot of trouble. And I wonder if I'm going to be given, given over to the police. I gesture to my taxi outside. I'm trying to sit back down again, and I decide for the moment at least I'm best to remain quiet. Then a man dressed in overalls, who obviously has some authority, appears, holding a young child. When he understands the situation, he smiles and gestures to me. I could fall from the building. Everyone seems somewhat relieved, especially the young man. And I understand I'm now free to return to my taxi. Just as we take off in the taxi, we're back and beckoned back. I communicate to the taxi driver, no, keep driving on. But my taxi driver stops. The man and child climb in. They're wanting a lift. <laughs> I smile and heave a sigh of relief. The most wonderful sight I saw here was an enormous mass of birds gathered together in a broad line along the high smad flats close to the incoming tide. It was estimated there were about 27,000 birds, perhaps 20,000 being godwits. Chinese and Korean villagers have traditionally depended on coastal wetlands for their livelihoods, sharing the mudflats with shorebirds. Their livelihoods are also being displaced by land reclamation. For the books I've worked on, I feel perhaps Circle has been one of the most difficult. Unlike my other book projects, there have been long stops before I restart. In my struggle to find the right balance to the work, the story took lots of different turns. In the early stages, I made the book more of a traditional story, but although I went about this carefully, I could see this approach really bothered some of the bird scientists helping me, who felt the story of the migration amazing enough in itself without imaginative addition. And then I got too bogged down with accuracies and found myself cutting, simplifying, and reworking the text again and again and again. I felt it important to have a child in the story the, the child reader could relate to, but found in my initial story of the child's appearance at the beginning and end of the book, the child took on too much importance and swamped the story of the birds. The balance was helped by deciding to cut the number of images including the child and to have the first and last child images single spreads rather than the originally designed double page spreads. The balance was also helped by placing the first image of the bedridden child before the title page. I've depicted the child in my story as an invalid with a desire to escape. Everyone wants to fly, but a child confined to bed has an even greater wish for it. The boy has a passion for birds, particularly godwits. The words on his tablet give the old English meaning of the word godwit as good creature, which most likely referred to it being good eating. The open book beside him is harder to decipher and reads, by following the direction of the Bartel Godwit across the southern seas, the Maoris were guided to the shores of New Zealand. In the next spread, the boy's in his wheelchair watching a flock of Godwits depart. In the final double page spread, the same boy has abandoned his crutches and is trying to stop a dog who's just scared off the birds. So if you look hard, you'll see the exhausted Godwit with white wing patches who's just completed his great journey from Alaska to Australia, still resting in the shallow. 
On the final page, the boy's back on his bed, daydreaming again, only this time he's flying with the birds. I see this as a symbolic and positive image. In my mind now, the boy feels well and free, and perhaps the Godwit escaped the dog. The first and last double page spreads are loosely based on Tara Point Nature Reserve in Botany Bay, Sydney's largest wetland. Godwits can be found here, and some species of migratory birds breed and nest here. There are notice boards prohibiting dogs, horses, and unauthorized vehicles, but nevertheless, it's not at all unusual to see horses and unleashed dogs along the beach. Throughout the work, I've made a point of a Godwit passing or sharing its environment with other migratory creatures, including humpback whales, green turtles, caribou, and a host of other migratory bird species. I needed to make the featured Godwit in my story distinctively recognizable from other Godwits in the story. I was careful not to give the Godwit a formal name or humanize it in any way, and so always refer to it as the Godwit with white wing patches or white patches. Some of the images are set against the plain white background. I felt the book needed the visual space this gives. I decided to feature the natural edges of my artwork in the interior images sitting within a double page spread, and in this way depict more of the nature of my artwork. The cover was designed as a single page, as this is the way a cover is most often seen. So this cover is also designed to work as a whole when the front and back cover are seen as one. The direction of the bird's flight moves the eye to open the book. The cover type was given a shadow to fit with the natural shadows created by my artwork. My books begin in a small way. They start with strong feelings and intuition, and following an instinct I've learned is worth taking seriously. As is my usual working process, this started as little more than scribbled on a smallish sheet of paper, initially very much working on the book as a whole, drawing lots of oblongs within a sheet of paper, imagining each as a double page spread within the book. As my ideas slowly evolved, the oblong boxes grew larger until each was eventually the size of a page of the book I hope would interest my publisher. At this stage, I'm also considering the book design and the positioning of any words on the page alongside the image, so words and images are visually integrated. I work on these drawings over and over and over again until I get to the point where I can see no way of taking the ideas further, and it's at this point that I send the layout drawings bound into book form to my publisher. There's a lot of communication between me and my British editor and designer, and as with this book, it's usual for them to question various details and see ways in which I can, can communicate my ideas more effectively. So again, I work over and over the images until we're all satisfied. It's at this point that I start work on the collages for the book, but I'm still working at refining and developing ideas and images in the book right until the very last opportunity before it's at the printing press. As with every new project, I enjoyed playing with collage materials I'd never tried before, and these included experimenting with using wax to depict ice and snow. I found depicting clouds a real challenge and experimented with lots of materials but mostly didn't quite achieve the result I hoped for. It was important to use a variety of different cloud effects, and perhaps some of my most successful clouds were created from goose down. In this work, I use the Bartell Godwit as a metaphor for shorebirds in general. To quote BirdLife Australia, no group of Australian birds has declined as rapidly over the last 30 years as our migratory shorebirds. This amazing phenomenon is in danger of imminent collapse because the vital staging areas on the migration route are being lost. Just in the last five years, there's been a loss of 65% of their feeding habitat, particularly within the Yellow Sea. 
The changes happening around the Yellow Sea make our Australian wetlands even more important. Because their journeys are so arduous, it's essential that shorebirds' habitat at both ends of their migration provides as much nourishment and as little disturbance as possible. But threats are happening everywhere, including in our own backyard. The passenger pigeon was once the most abundant bird in the world. It lived in enormous migratory flocks, one flock being described in 1866 a darkening sky, holding in excess of 3.5 billion birds and taking 14 hours to pass. However, less than 50 years later, due to hunting and habitat loss, the species was extinct. The annual movements across the world as millions of birds, sea creatures and other animals remind us that everything in nature is interdependent and connected. Changes we make on one side of the world can cause enormous consequences in another. The challenge we face now is how to live our lives without destroying the places crucial to the shorebirds' ancient, wondrous circle of life. just want to finish by saying there's so much freedom in the possibilities of what can become a children's picture book. I feel extremely fortunate to be working in an area where I can make a living exploring and doing exactly what I want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs>